Okay. So welcome everyone. Uh, it is my pleasure to chair this year's Early Career Prize from the SIM Activity Group on Imaging Science. Let me start telling you a bit about the prize that we are awarding today. The SIAG Imaging Science awards the SIAG IS Early Career Prize to one individual in their early career for distinguished contributions to the field of imaging science. The first prize was awarded in 2016 to Mauricio Del Brasio. No award was made in 2018 and is now awarded for the second time in 2020. The selection committee for the 2020 award was composed of Gitta Coutinho as the chair, Julian Chang, Omar Gattas, Stefan Wild and myself. This year, the SIAG IS Early Career Prize is dedicated to Mila Nikolova, who passed away in 2018. Mila is known to many of us for her substantial contributions in optimization, in particular the analysis of solutions to optimization problems and application of optimization techniques in image processing and inverse problems and has been an important mentor for many early career researchers, including many, I'm sure, in the audience today. The SIAG Imaging Science Early Career Prize in 2020 is awarded to Yaniv Romano for his major contributions to several areas of imaging, in particular in combination with statistics and data science. Yaniv is a postdoctoral scholar in the Department of Statistics at Stanford University, mentored by, by uh, Emmanuel Candes. He earned his PhD and MSc degrees in 2017 from the Department of Electrical Engineering at the Technion under the supervision of Miki Elad. Romano's research spans the theory and practice of selective, in, uh, of selective inference, sparse approximation, machine learning, data science, and signal and image processing. His goal is to advance the theory and practice of modern machine learning, as well as to develop statistical tools that can be wrapped around any data-driven algorithm to provide valid inferential results. The talk, the title of his prize talk today is Regularization by Denoising, read. Um, and I really look forward to your talk now, Yaniv. So the word is over Thank to you. you. Thank you very much for your uh, kind words. Uh, thank you everyone for attending and special thanks again for the committee for providing me this unique and very exciting opportunity to be at this stage and communicate with you my knowledge about RED, so thanks. Uh, so this is a joint work with these two titans, uh, Mickey and Payman, my collaborators, mentors, friends, uh, what I do know is that I'm extremely lucky to have them in my life. So thank you, Mickey and Payman. So our story starts with this, what we call little engine, a denoising algorithm aiming to address one of the most fundamental tasks in our field, the denoising problem. Here, what we get to see is a noisy measurement, Y, of some unknown image X contaminated by white Gaussian noise B. So the way it works and the way I will denote my denoiser is this with this function f that operates on y and spits out an estimate x hat that should be as close as possible to the unknown x. And of course this attracts a lot of attention and what I'm showing you here is a timeline trying to summarize around 20,000 papers just published on denoising, on image denoising. Starts from L2 based regularization, go through robust statistics. The 90s was an amazing decade for this. Think about wavelets or PDE methods such as total variation, or even heuristic methods such, such as bilateral filter that I'm certain that is still being used by many sensors to this day. A better variant of them are the self similarity methods such as the non local means, and I'm sure that most of you are familiar with. And more recently, we get a BIM 3D that combines ideas from wavelets and, and self-similarity, or KSVD that relies on dictionary learning, a method that is very close to my heart. Other patch-based methods, such as the PLL, and more recently, the neural nets ideas. Of course, this could not pass our field as well. 
So you may wonder whether this problem is dead. Of course, this is so practical problem and every paper improves over the other. Actually, Payman and his student asked this question in 2010, 10 years ago, is denoising dead? And the rationale behind this question is the following. Think about it. There's so many different algorithms relying on completely different ideas or priors, and yet they perform almost the same. Actually, you can write down the math behind it, and that's what Payman and his students, and later Levine and Nadler, and what they found is that we're indeed not that far from the ceiling in terms of the MSC sense. So the bottom line, at least the way I see it, is that largely speaking, well, the denoising problem seems to be dead. Or if you disagree about this with me, probably you agree that improving denoising performance in terms of MSC at least, seems to lead to diminishing returns. So in this work, Instead of trying to improve existing algorithms, what I will do, I will leverage this very impressive achievement and try to use it to solve other problems in imaging. Think about super resolution or deep learning. Formally, I will denote the problem of image recovery by minimizing this map energy function, which has two terms. The left is the negative log likelihood, this LXY. And if you're in the business of deep learning, I'm sure that you're familiar with this notion, HX minus Y, where H is the blur kernel. On the right, this RX is the holy grail of our field, the prior, the regularizer. Loosely speaking, what does it mean to be a good looking image? Again, we have this vast evolution of denoising priors that developed over the years. And what we are asking ourselves here is, how can we take these very impressive denoising algorithms and formulate them as priors for imaging to solve and address other tasks? I want a fully flexible scheme. I want a general scheme. So I will show you in this talk that a denoiser can do much more than just denoising. And this set of ideas relies or inspired by these two great words plug and play priors and Laplacian regularization. So here is the plug and play. That's a title at least of the original paper as far as I know. It's a beautiful piece of work and I know that the next talk is about, the, is about it. So I'll try to say a few words about it. But that's quite of remarkable. It's a short paper, four pages if I'm correctly that made a huge contribution. And the reason, at least the way I see it, is that it puts in the center the idea that a denoiser can serve as a regularizer in some sense. So the original idea is to minimize this map energy function, it's hard to solve a problem, using the ADMM. So it's a very nice optimization trick that allows you to split the hard to solve problem into easy to solve sub problems. Concretely, suppose that we are in this business of deep learning. Again, my L is Ajax minus Y L to norm. Now, if you write down carefully the equations of the ADMM, you will get to see that we need to iterate these two steps many, many times. First step involves a solution of a linear system of equations, AKA sharpening step, so to speak. Then this is followed by a denoising step you denoise the sharpened image. So now you need to repeat this many, many times. Sharpen, denoise, sharpen, denoise, sharpen, denoise. And if you're relying on a powerful denoiser and you're lucky enough, you will get to see that you get state-of-the-art performance in, deno in the blurring, super resolution, whatever inverse problem you're trying to solve, even if the prior is unknown, the prior of the denoiser. Yet, this is a beautiful idea, but there are some problems with it, at least at the time of, of publishing the original paper. And if you will play with it a bit, you will see that the ADMM parameter tuning is really difficult. I will talk about it a little bit later on. There is no consistent or prior that I can actually compute or cost function that I can track down while minimizing the cost. Think about it, Rx might be unknown. Convergence, convexity, all of these are open problems at the time of 
of publishing the original paper. And the desire to address these problems drove us and many as many other research groups to tackle, to trying to tackle and answer the riddles that emerge from this. And today I will present one work, our work, Regularization by Denoising, that relies on this idea of Laplacian regularization. The second brilliant idea that I managed to catch during my PhD, and thank you, Miki, for your supervision, of course. And here, the observation is the following. Turns out that we can formulate or describe denoising algorithms as a matrix vector multiplication. Here, W is a, what we call pseudo-linear filter, is a matrix of size n by n, n is the length, the size of the image. W is a function of x, so it's an image adaptive filter, representing very highly nonlinear function. So it turns out that you can represent many denoising algorithms in this way. Let me give you an example. Think about the non-local means. By the way, if you're not familiar with, this non with the non-local means, you must read about it. So the idea behind the non-local means is to denoise a patch by looking for its nearest neighbors. So that's highly non-linear operation, obviously. And compute some sort of similarity weight, another non-linear step. But then, once you know the non-linear weights, the similarity weights, all you need to do is to run a, this linear filter on the image, and you get a, and you get a result as if you run fx. And of course, you can do it for many other denoisers, such as KSVD, BIM3D, and so on. Why do we care about it? Because now I can formulate an image adaptive filter, this Laplacian filter. This is nothing but a residual x minus wx. And now I can just play around with this equation and write lx, l equals to i minus w. Why do I care about it? Because I can now formulate my regularizer in this form, x transpose lx. Intuitively, what I'm doing here, I'm penalizing, in a way, the high frequencies in the image denoiser domain. And that's a great idea. It actually works really good. What is the problem? The problem is that I need to compute this Laplacian matrix. And that's hard. Think about it. What happens if you have 10 megapixel image? How can you compute this L? And now you need to work with it. You need to minimize this cost function. But X is changing, so you need also to update L. But it's expensive. It's tough. So in practice, what people are doing, they update it once in a while. But then it's not clear anymore even what we're minimizing. So it's a way a heuristic approach, but it's a brilliant idea. The way I see red is that we are going to fix, in a way, these problems. So what is red? A very step, a small step from this idea of Laplacian regularization that makes a huge difference. So this is what we saw before, x transpose times the residual, x minus wx, before I wrote i minus w as l. So with red, what we do is something extremely simple. Instead of wx, we are writing f of x. Now f at this point can be any denoising function. You may wonder, wait, well, how this guy is going to compute the derivative of this term? That's the essence of this talk. It will become clear. In, as, as far as we go in this talk. But at the moment, let's try to understand better the meaning of this prior. So let's wonder to ourselves, what is the most likely image? What is the image that our prior says that this is so great image that we're just happy with what we have? It's a situation where our x equals to zero. And there are three, three situations that this happens. The first one here is trivial, so I'm not covering it, of course. The second is super interesting. It's a case where, imagine that I'm having a denoising function, extremely sophisticated one. Think about the most fancy neural net algorithm that you can have in mind. And now I'm feeding to this neural network my estimated image x. And what this neural net is telling me, hey, Aniv, listen, this image 
is just perfect. I have nothing to do. It looks so terrific to me. Just take it as is. This is a case where our prior will say, great job. Another case that our prior will be happy is a situation where we have this orthogonality. Idea that accompany the field of signal and image processing for decades. Think about the orthogonal matching pursuit of Danzig selector. This is a case where the inner product between X and the residual is zero. So back to reality, how am I going to minimize this cost? How can I compute the derivative of this guy? A teaser, it's going to be simple. So simple that we're not going to need any explicit access to the gradient of F. But to achieve this, I need to make some assumptions to rigorously compute the gradient of red. So the first three assumptions that you see here are required to compute the gradient of red. And the last assumption here related to convexity. We will discuss about it later. So the first assumption that I need is that F would be differentiable. That is, that the, the Jacobian matrix would exist. Second, I need F to be local homogeneous. What does it mean? The homogeneity property, I'm sure that you're all familiar with it. What it tells is that if I take my input x, I will multiply it by a scalar, and I will run my denoising function, I will get the same result as if I will first run my denoiser and only then multiply the result by a scalar. But notice that this scalar is not any scalar. It's a scalar that's very, very, very close to one. Here, epsilon goes to zero. This is why we call it local. The last assumption, and thank you, Rehorse and Schneider for this, is I need to assume that the Jacobian matrix would be symmetric. So J equals J transpose. The bonus property convexity will hold if our filter would be passive. And we will understand later why do we need it. Now, probably you wonder why, well, does my favorite denoiser satisfying these assumptions or not? Well, let me tell you something. There is a, a gap here between theory and practice, but in a good sense. And what the gap is showing us is practical experience hints that eventually you can work with almost any denoising algorithm that you like, starting from the simple median filter that obviously violates the assumptions that I'm making, all the way to state-of-the-art, super complicated scene in algorithms. So that's what practice, the practice shows us, and later I'll discuss a little bit about it. So now what I will do, I will rely on these assumptions that I make. I will show you the implication of them, and then I will somehow merge all these implications together to formulate the gradient of red. The first implication of differentiability and homogeneity is that we have extremely easy access to the directional derivative of f. So on the top here, you see the definition of the directional derivative. I'm sure that you're all familiar with it. Now notice that here the direction can be any direction d. But with red, we don't care about any direction. We care about very, very specific one. A direction d equals x. That is, here what we have is j times x. And now I just wrote down the equation. Instead of d, I'm writing x. And now I'm using, I'm invoking the local homogeneity assumption. And the trivial algebra shows the, the, the directional derivative of f in direction x equals to f of x. That is to say, to compute the directional derivative, I don't need to compute j. All I need to do is to invoke f. Now, before we saw something like that, we saw a situation that we have a matrix j. Here is j times x equals to f. It happened to us in the pseudo-linear filter. W times X. Of course, W and J are two different animals. And here, J is actually way more general than the W that we discussed before. And it's easy. I don't need to compute it explicitly. The cost is that I need to make the assumption that my function is local homogeneous. 
To gain some intuition, why does it make sense to make this assumption? Let me show you an implication, another implication of differentiability and homogeneity, what we call filter stability. So imagine that I'm taking my image X and I'm adding a very small perturbation to it, this vector H. And now I'm just doing this linear approximation. I'm replacing F with this directional derivative property. It's a very important property in the literature on red. And now what I'm doing is just rearranging the terms. And look what I got. I got that a small perturbation in the input does not affect much the Jacobian matrix, my filter matrix that meets X plus H. This is what we call filter stability. Hopefully it provides you some intuition. I will skip over the requirement for symmetry of the Jacobian. You, later on, we will see why do we need it. But now what I want to mention is this requirement of passivity. Again, I need it for convexity. So passivity means that the spectral radius of my J matrix should be bounded by one. Why does it make sense to make this assumption? Here is the intuition. On the left here, I'm computing the norm of the denoised image, the norm of Fx. And with trivial steps, you can bound it by looking at the norm of the input X. That is the norm of the denoised image under this assumption one of the implications is that it is bounded by the norm of X. Of course, this is something that we can embrace that a denoising function will not increase the energy of the input. You may wonder how to compute it. Turns out that there is a very easy way to do it. I will not cover it here ex exactly, but the idea is to use the power method. The problem is that with the power method, you need to compute a Jacobian matrix and it sounds hard, but actually there is a way out. Again, I would not explain this because of time constraints, but I just want to tell you that in the paper, you can read out and see how to test if your favorite denoiser satisfies this property, just by running the denoiser, denoiser many times. The bottom line is that many denoising algorithms indeed satisfy this assumption. And again, the intuition follows. So let me summarize the properties and why do we need it? Differentiability, I need it because I must assume that J exists. J appears all over the place. Homogeneity, I need it to compute the directional derivative without computing J. The intuition is the filter stability property that we discussed. The symmetry of J, I need it to compute the gradient. It's not clear at the moment exactly why. You will see it in a second and the passivity for convexity. And again, you will see in a second why. Okay, so that's my prior. This is what I get on the top, inner product between X and the residual. Now let's together carefully, let's compute the derivative of this guy. X transpose X, the derivative is just X, that's easy. And now we ended up with computing the derivative of X transpose F. So taking the gradient with respect to X leads to this FX, now I'm doing the chain rule. And now taking the gradient with respect to F is more tricky. And you will see that I have basically J plus J transpose average times X. And under the assumption that my Jacobian matrix is symmetry, I get J times X. And now I use the local homogeneity assumption. And what I ended up with is that the gradient of this seemingly complicated prior to derive is nothing but the residual X minus FX. So again, in order to compute the gradient of this guy under our three assumptions, well, I don't need to have explicit access to the gradient of X. Let's there, and let's compute the second derivative. So here's the first derivative, x minus fx. The second derivative is just this. The derivative of x is i, the identity matrix, and f becomes j. Now under the assumptions of passivity, what I end up with 
is a Haitian that is positive semi-definite. And therefore, my objective, my cost function under the four assumptions that we make is convex, is convex. So what is the implication? Imagine that again, we're in this business of de -blaring. We have the log likelihood term, well, it's convex. We have our prior, it is convex, under the four assumptions. Moreover, I know how to take the derivative of this guy. That's easy on the left. On the right, it's even easier, just the residual, that's it. So I have a convex function. I know how to take the gradient. Now I can plug it into any state of the art optimization algorithm and I will be in amazing shape. Of course, you may wonder, well, what happens if the assumptions are violated? Again, I told you, there is a gap between theory and practice, but in a good sense. In a good sense is that eventually what we get to see in practice is that you plug your state of the art denoiser and you get state-of-the-art performance in other tasks, seemingly leveraging this vast improvement of denoising priors. Just plug your F and take the gradient step as if everything goes through. Okay, so in our paper, we presented three different algorithms to minimize this cost, steepest descent, ADMM, and fixed point. So steepest descent is easy. I'm sure you can write it down in a second. The ADMM is very interesting because it connects red to plug and play. Unfortunately, I don't have the time to cover this. So we'll just continue to describing the fixed point. And I will show you that there are very interesting implications of this algorithm. Since our publication, there were many other interesting optimization techniques that developed, such as SMD, BCD, PGM, and so on for minimizing this objective that are even way, way faster. So thank you for these contributions. So let's derive down, let's write down the fixed point algorithm. And that's very easy. I'm going to do it using basically three simple steps. The first is just take the derivative of the objective function and equate it to zero. And you see here H transpose times the residual and on the right, you see the gradient of red x minus fx. Now notice that x appears both as the argument of f and also outside, and therefore I'm putting these indices xk, xk plus one. And this allows me to rearrange the terms, and here I get the update rule for the fixed point. So let's read it together. What I'm doing here, I'm denoising the previous image, and then I'm sharpening it, multiplying by this matrix. So the noise sharpened, the noise sharpened, the noise sharpened. We saw it before in the plug and play. Of course, it's not a surprise. There is a connection between these two algorithms. By the way, what's the difference here? Under our four assumptions, we have a convex objective and therefore this optimization method is guaranteed to converge to global optimum. Let's play a bit with this formula. So now what I'm going to do, I'm going to be a little bit modern and write down the fixed point algorithm as a block diagram. And so this is what I'm doing here. I'm taking my X, I'm applying my denoising function on it, that's the first block. And then I'm multiplying the result by the matrix M, so that's the sharpening filter, so to speak. I'm adding a vector B to it, this is my vector B and I get a new X. And now I'm going to repeat it many times at a fixed point algorithm. You see this block diagrams repeating. Let me denote by ZK minus one, the output of F that operates on XK minus one, and by ZK, the output of F XK. And now let me shift this block diagram one element to the left. Let me read it again. I'm taking the input I'm convolving it with a filter defined by this M. I'm adding a bias and I'm applying a nonlinear function. Again, I'm taking the input to the kth layer. I'm running a filter, convolving it with a filter, adding a bias and applying a nonlinear function. 
I'm sure that you understand where I'm going to. It's basically a formulation in a way of a deep neural net obtained by unfolding this rigorous fixed point algorithm, minimizing a map energy function. What's the major difference between this and classic CNN? Is that now the nonlinear function is not a ReLU nonlinearity or the sigmoid function. It's a denoiser adapted to the image, designed to work and filter images. So that's what we call reducation, the trainable version of red. The inspiration is the learned ISTA by Gregor and the crew. So now you may wonder what happens if I will set this MKBK, the filter and the vector B as three parameters as the weights of the network. And I will optimize them. I will learn them from end to end using some sort of back propagation rules and minimize a supervised loss function, say the MSE. And let me compare this to the analytic formulation of M and B. Again, I know exactly what is my filter M and I know exactly what is the vector B. And now what I will do, I will use here a symmetric version of the non-local means denoiser as F. Actually in reducation, in this paper that I published together with Mickey and Payman, we derive these back propagation rules that you can work with even a denoiser like the non-local means. Of course, it was, if it was a neural net, it was very easy. Just use PyTorch or TensorFlow. And now let me show you what happens if I'm learning this M and B. On the right, let's just look on the right figure, the root mean squared error versus the number of iterations or the depth of the network is just the same because again, I'm unfolding the fixed point algorithm. The blue curve here corresponds to the analytic red, that is run the fixed point with a fixed M and fixed B. The red curve that you see here corresponding to learning the, ve the vector B in the matrix M. And as you can see, we get better reconstructions with less iterations. So now let me compare red to other methods. And now there is no learning involved anymore. And just using the fixed point or steepest descent or ADMM versions of it with this matrix M and vector B. So no end-to-end -end learning. Let me start with some deblurring results. And of course, I'm not expecting that you can tell the differences between the images. There is a special reason that I'm showing you this picture. The median filter that you see in the top right. So what I'm having here is this. I'm taking my ground truth, I'm now blurring it. So that's the input, a blurred version of the ground truth contaminated by some noise. And now on the right, I'm just running the fixed point algorithm where I set the denoising engine to be the median filter. This so trivial algorithm to work with. And look what we get. Of course, if you plug in better denoisers such as the TNRD, which is a state-of-the-art CNN method, you get way better performance. I'm sure that you can compare at least the PKSNR values here. And the result is very similar, by the way, to the ones that you will get if you run the plug and play using the same denoiser, the TNRD. And all these results compared to other state-of-the-art methods designed to specifically, for instance, for deblurring tasks. The reason I'm showing you this table is to just to say that red and plug and play are very much competitive. In fact, in terms of performance, denoising or deblurring or super resolution performance, there is no much of a difference between the two. We also apply super resolution and we also got state of the art results. Yet, you may wonder, so what is the difference between red and plug and play? So one of the I think, in my view at least, major differences, at least at, again, at the time of me measuring, working with the plug and play using the ADMM scheme, is that I found that RED is extremely robust to the choice of hyperparameters in the optimization technique itself. So let's understand this better. 
what I'm plotting here is the peak SNR value versus the number of iterations of these iterative minimizers, minimization algorithm that we work with. So that's what you see in the colored curves, the steepest descent in red, the fixed point algorithm in green, and the ADMM in blue. And you see the dynamics of these algorithms is different, but what is amazing is at the end, we get extremely, exactly, sorry, the same peak SNR value. In contrast, if you look at this black curve, this curve corresponds to the plug and play work with the ADMM. So it goes up, it is touching the same peak SNR value actually, surprising even, but then for some reason it drops. And you may say, hey, maybe an Eve does not know how to work with the ADMM. And here is what happens if I use the plug and play with different hyperparameters of the ADMM method itself. Again, this, this behavior basically motivated us and many others to come up with better solutions for this optimization task. So you see anyways, that it's not that stable to the choice of hyperparameters. If you look at red, look what happens. I told you there is an ADMM version of it. So now I'm changing the hyperparameters of this optimization technique. I'm using again, the same denoiser, the same lambda regularization penalty. And what I get is of course, different behavior, different dynamics, but at the end, the same peak SNR value. We also deploy this technology for video super resolution. So the task here is the following. You get to see a sequence of low resolution frames and you somehow want to leverage them to construct a high resolution video. The classic approach based on this, sim based on this very simple idea. Let's align these low resolution frames somehow and then fuse them to form the high resolution video. What is the challenge? The challenge is that I need to somehow align the images and therefore I need extremely accurate sub pixel motion estimation algorithm. But that's hard because I have noise and because the images are blurry. But if you think about it, this is something that we already understood way, way before when, des when designing video denoising algorithms. There is, there is no hope to rely on exact motion estimation algorithm. And that's exactly what we can do with RED. We can formulate the super resolution problem as a, as a, and translate it as a sequence of a, applications of video denoising steps. And this is what we're doing here. I took the ADMM version of the plug and play, of the plug and play or RED and I plugged with it the VBM3D, an algorithm that published more than 10 years ago. And look at the results on these sequences of videos. In terms of peak SNR, we are outperforming by a large gap a state-of-the-art video super resolution based on deep neural nets. Another cool application by my colleagues, Payman and Mickey, and the student Gary, is to empower the deep image prior using red. So I don't know if you're not familiar with this idea of deep image prior, it's a brilliant concept that instead of the classic line of thinking that you feed a network where you feed to it the input, the degraded input, and you get in the output its high resolution version, if you're in, in super resolution for instance, what the authors of the deep image prior suggested is to fit, fit to your neural net a specially designed noise seed. And then you somehow synthesize the high resolution video, or sorry, the high resolution image. So this is a brilliant idea, but there, unfortunately, it does not perform as good as state of the art super resolution techniques. And what Mickey, Payman, and Gary showed is that if you use this idea of red, Together with the deep image power, you get very, very impressive performance. So in a way, it's a hybrid approach of synthesis and recovery. As for the theoretical question, 
The way I see it at the moment is that the theoretical justification of Fred is still an open question. And actually what we Horst and Schneider educated us in a very interesting paper is that if your denoising function, if J is asymmetric, there is no prior whose gradient is the residual. And that's extremely, extremely surprising. Why? Think about it. All the results that I showed you before, the video super resolution, the signal, the single image super resolution, the, the blurring results, all of them are relying on this gradient step of taking the residual. But what they're telling us is that there is no prior that exists if J is asymmetric. And actually there are denoising functions that whose J is asymmetric. So they come up with this core matching by denoising a variant of red that suggests a way out, suggests a way to explain this phenomenon. Another very surprising paper published very recently, at least on, I think it's an archive, is this red pro by Payman, Mickey and Regev. And I'm sorry that I'm biased towards the publications of my colleagues. But this paper is extremely interesting. What this paper is doing is that it offers a unified approach for red and plug and play. A new variant of the map energy function that I described before. And if you look at this new variant, you get to see the connection between red and plug and play. Moreover, they suggest increased flexibility in choosing the denoising function to minimize this new map energy. And also they prove that you get global convergence, of course, under some assumptions. So to wrap up this talk, this talk is about red. I would say that there is a new prior in town, as Mickey said in his course and sparse presentations, that's based on a denoising function. So here we are leveraging the great advance, these impressive achievements, the denoising problem is nearly solved. And now we are using these denoising functions to solve other problems in imaging. The message is literally this, take your favorite denoiser algorithm, your state-of-the-art denoiser, and obtain state-of-the-art performance in other more challenging tasks. I think that the appealing property of RED is that there is no need to explicitly compute the derivative of f. And now you can just solve many other inverse problems with this technique. Open questions and challenges. First, I think that question that blows my mind, for instance, is that how can we design denoising functions that satisfy red conditions? that satisfy red assumptions? How can we bake these assumptions inside the formulation of F? Of course, you will benefit a lot if you will be able to do it. The second point is to move beyond MSC. I think that we're tired about this measure a bit. And I think that for instance, the work by Gary Payman and Mickey is a way of thinking towards this this direction, combine synthesis with red in some sense. And lastly, of course, this open question of what happens if red's assumptions are violated. If you read carefully the paper by Payman and Mickey, for instance, you will see that indeed they suggest some solutions, but there are also very interesting open questions that emerge from this. So that's it. Uh, I want to thank again the committee for this amazing opportunity to be at this stage and give this prize lecture. So thank you so much and thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Yanif. Uh, I, I clap my hands. <laughs> I think. <laughs> um, uh, on behalf of everyone, it was a really great talk. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. I'm happy to hear um, <laughs> So uh, just to remind everyone uh, that you can ask questions uh, via the Q&A box or the chat. 
Uh, and while people are thinking about questions, let me ask you a first question, Yaniv. Yeah. Um, are there um, common denoisers uh, that fulfill uh, conditions uh, that you need for red? Are there, are there examples of denoisers which fulfill those? That's, good. That's a great question. Uh, actually, I spent the last few days, because I didn't work on this for a while, I spent exactly these uh, last days to think about it. And uh, the short question, the, the short answer is that I'm not aware about this, of a state of the art denoiser that satisfies these assumptions. Um, there are some examples that I can give you, such as the winner filter, the L2 regularization, of course, it will satisfy this. But to rigorously answer this, let's think about the assumptions and let's think what kind of algorithms would satisfy them. Let's start with the symmetry assumption. J should be equal to J transpose. This holds for MMSC denoisers. This holds for denoisers that are the outcome of an, a solution to a, a rigorous optimization problem that you formulate. For instance, a minimizer of a map energy would satisfy this assumption. Mm -hmm. So that's the symmetry. Uh, the differentiability, okay, that's clear. The local homogeneity is very tricky. For instance, um, there are denoising functions that you might think that are satisfying this, such as a thresholding techniques, but unfortunately they are not. And so the, the way I think about it is that if I have a cost function that is strictly convex and smooth, I expect it to satisfy this assumption. Mm -hmm. And the passivity, in my view, almost any denoiser would satisfy it. The intuition is that I'm not going to increase the energy. So that basically takes me to this future direction that I mentioned. I think that it's doable to design algorithms that are satisfying red assumptions but then you need to be very careful in the way that you formulate your, for instance, map energy function that drives you to get your F. Super. Um, so thanks a lot. And I think that leads very nicely to a question that uh, Antonin has. And Antonin, if, you're, uh, if I'm not putting you too much onto the spot, then I think I can allow you to talk, which is maybe easier. So you should be allowed to talk now, Antuna, if you wanted to ask a question. Hello. Hey. Hello. Yeah. I did, I did not prepare a microphone. I don't know if it this will work. Yeah, we uh, yeah, work. I have two, two questions, Mark. So uh, the, this local homogeneity is a bit strange because I don't see how it's not completely equivalent to global homogeneity, and in particular, yeah, it yeah. means you don't have regularity at zero, but it's not very important, I think. But I, I'm, I'm a bit puzzled by this local homogeneity because so, it's global. So, I mean. so again, I don't understand the question. Why do we need a local homogeneity? Or? No, why, why do you define a local homogeneity, which for me is oh, equivalent no. to global homogeneity? I mean, positive homogeneity. Uh, yeah, the, the, I understand. The, the reason is that uh, if you think about the directional derivative property, um, so in the directional derivative property, right, that's the definition, and the epsilon goes to zero. Mm. And that's the only reason, so that's the place where we invoke this assumption. Yeah, sure, but, uh, but yeah. it's true, then it's, it's homogeneous, no, if it's true. Yeah. Yeah, of course, if you're global homogeneous, of course, it, it, this will hold. No, but also converse. Yes, I agree. And, and I had, uh, but uh, I, I, I'm not sure this, this condition is so important because I think it seems that the, the most important is, is, um, is what you call what passivity, maybe? This, because uh, this passivity is saying that x minus f of x is a monotone operator. So it means that already your, uh, your uh, equation for your uh, fixed point is well posed and probably should have a solution with um, few assumptions. Yeah, but eventually you need to take the gradient, right? And 
No, but I mean, if you just consider the gradient as an operator, so x minus f, mm -hmm. then this condition is the condition which says that it's a monotone operator and that probably you, your problem is solvable with standard algorithms. Oh, so you think I can I can approximate? I can if I understand you correctly. So you're saying that I can approximate the gradient by saying, okay, let's. Say, X I think it's not so X important. X it's X a X gradient. X it's more important that it's monotone, which is this condition. If but maybe I don't know. Hmm. So that's really interesting. Um, yeah. And uh, it seems that there is lots of uh, uh, points for discussion, maybe for uh, private follow-up. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> uh, I, I would love to understand better your comment about it because I'm not sure that okay, that's sorry. perfectly. Oh, it just shows you, Yaniv, that there, is, uh, there are lots of interesting questions coming out of your, um, of your red approach. So it's really yeah. good. Yeah. Um, so, um, Yaniv, may I congratulate you again? Many, many congratulations. Thank you, Thank you so um, much. I, was, uh, I definitely uh, have been probably one of the first people reading the paper. Uh, was, is, is really, really interesting. Thanks a, lot for, uh, thanks a lot for working on this and for, Thank you so uh, share, and for sharing it with us also in this last uh, 40 minutes or so. Um, so, I will need to go now to the next session, which is um, uh, which is the best paper prize, uh, and I encourage everyone to follow me. Uh, thank you so much, Yaniv, again, uh, and goodbye, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.